Legendary and late uh, composer and pianist of Chick Corea called Spain. Beautiful. All right. Good job. Now we'd like to welcome um, wonderful vocalist uh, Ava Preston, and on drums Ben Bosler, and on bass Eli Letter. Hmm. By the way, it's so important to know the schools that everybody's coming from, right? Because they're all all your directors and mentors and you know it's such a it's a, such a communal effort right I mean that really starts uh, at, at, at the school level and middle school and high school and we all will never forget our great band directors in middle school and high school and the invaluable role that they've played in our musical development and here at the Jazz Fest Academy is kind of an extension of all that um, but it's really important to know all the different schools the first group I know we had Cleveland Heights represented and a couple of others I know Orange and for this, uh, so Liam, we got you. All right, good. So Eli, which school? Uh, Avon. Avon? Solon? Solon? Beachwood. Beachwood. All right, great. Wonderful. So thank you. By the way, the applause. So it's very nice. I know we're all spread out. That's great. We're all being safe, awesome, most important. But let's just try just, just, a, just an applause to try to. That so I'm going to give you like one, two, three, and like clapping like with real intensity, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Get some screaming in there. All right, good. Yeah, yeah, that's good. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, that was for me, not you guys, for me. That's good. All right, very, very good. All right, and really the concept of um, this, um, this kind of project, um, you know, is really kind of a tiered mentorship program, right, where we have faculty members uh, playing uh, with, uh, with the students. And because uh, when, when uh, COVID began, uh, most of our in-person activities, you know, had to... Um, uh, go online, but we managed to be able to rehearse rhythm sections. We couldn't have horn players, right? So we rehearsed rhythm sections for almost two years, you know, straight and, and several already graduated, but that was kind of like the beginning of really kind of amassing a really large amount of rhythm section players here in the program, which is absolutely great. And so that's why uh, for today, you know, you see three different kind of rhythm sections and really dealing with proper accompaniment, dealing with the harmony and dealing with the melody and melodic development and the great responsibility and independence that we kind of all have to deal with, with when it comes to uh, creating, uh, you know, uh, creating a song and playing a song together, right? Everybody has their individual and collective role in the, in the organization, or in this case, in the bandstand, right? So, okay, here we go. This is We'll Meet Again, right? Excellent.
again Don't know where, don't know when But I know we'll meet again Some sunny day Keep smiling through Just like you always do Till the blue skies drive the dark clouds far away And would you please say hello to the folks that I know Tell them I won't be long They'll be happy to know that as you saw me go I was singing this song Don't know where, don't know when But I know we'll meet again Some sunny day We'll meet again Don't know where, don't know when But I know we'll meet again
folks that I know Tell them I won't be alone They'll be happy to know that as you saw me go I was singing this song Transition one more time, yeah. Oh, let's get Bolivia. Here's Bolivia, right? All right. So we got just a couple more songs for you. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think we did make a change. I think I messed up the the order. Yes. Oh. Let's see what happens here. Hopefully somebody will. Oh, there we go. All right, Henry's back. Emma's back. Yep, and Ben is here. Was that the wrong order for me? No. Oh, it was right? Yeah. Oh, what are you guys doing? We wait for them to get off. Oh, great. Okay, cool. <laughs> Perfect. All right. There we go. Mm. By the way, how many here who are here today are, um, are educators, music educators, or any teacher? Oh, wonderful. Wow, great, great. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. And, um, uh, you know, we, we couldn't uh, succeed here in, in, in the Jazz Fest Academy without, um, without the hard and diligent work of helping to grow these students and take the time and, uh, to, to help develop and nurture uh, their path, their past. And we're forever grateful for all the wonderful work you do. Cleveland, we feel, is a very special place for many reasons, one being uh, commitment to arts education and especially with the wonderful history of the Tri-C Jazz Fest here. We're grateful to, to be able to have this program and to move it forward and continue to develop the next generation of, of musicians. Right. So here is Bolivia. You got it?
Wonderful. So for our uh, final song of uh, this set, um, this is a great standard song called uh, My Shining Hour here. And yes, start off, Eli and I. This, this is the final song, yeah. Mm -hmm. Everybody enjoying yourself so far? It's all right? Good. Looking forward to seeing the film, and I'd like to give a very special thanks to Dr. Paul Cox, Dean of Creative Arts here at Tri-C for, for conceptualizing this whole thing, and this, this is such a spe special film on, on, on many levels, and uh, John Baptiste, wonderful pianist who obviously played an instrumental role in this film and wrote the music for it. Um, we went to school at, at Juilliard together a little while back and saw him a few months ago and couldn't be more more thrilled uh, to see the wonderful success that he, he's had and the wonderful impact that he's had on our music community over the years. So this is a special film for sure and looking forward to seeing it. So, all right. Mm. Say that, 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 that,
flower through the darkness of the Thank you all so much. Yeah, Ava and Liam and Eli and Nehemiah. Thank you. My name is Dominic Farinacci, director of the Tri-C Jazz Fest Academy, and thank you all so much for coming out. Looking forward to the next part of today's event. All right, take care. All right, ladies and gentlemen, can we get one more round of applause for Dominic Farinacci's Tri-C Jazz Academy. Those students are fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Is everyone having a good time? I said, is everyone having a good time? Good, good, good. All right, so we're almost, almost at the moment everyone has been waiting for, which is the screening of Soul. But before we actually play the movie, we have a segment where we're going to do a, a virtual interview with the guy who's behind this whole film and Pixar. He's like the head of Pixar, super big deal, right? So I'm going to read his bio and introduce the gentleman who will be conducting the interview who goes by the name of Dean Paul Cox. He's the Dean of the Creative Arts Department here at Tri-C Metro. Dr. Paul Cox is an amazing Amazing boss, amazing guy to work for. He's all about the creative arts, and you'll get a sense of that tonight in um, his virtual interview. So, a bio while we do this set change. Pete Doctor is the Oscar-winning director of Monsters, Inc., Up and Inside Out, and chief creative officer at Pixar Animation Studios. He most recently directed Disney and Pixar's Oscar-winning feature film, Soul which is why we're all here, <laughs> with producer Dana Murray and co-director Kemp Powers, which is now streaming on Disney+. Plus. Starting at Pixar in 1990 as the studio's third animator, Dr. collaborated and helped develop the story and characters for the legendary film Toy Story, one of my favorites. <laughs> Pixar's first full-length animated feature film for which he also was the supervising animator, he served as the storyboard artist on A Bug's Life and wrote initial story treatments for both Toy Story 2 and Wall-E. Aside from directing his three films, Doctor also executive produced Monsters University and the Academy Award winning Brave. Doctor's interest in animation began at the age of eight when he created his first flipbook, he studied character animation at California Institute of the Arts in Valencia, California, where he produced a variety of short films, one of which won a Student Academy Award. Those films have since been shown in animation festivals worldwide and are featured on the Pixar Short Films Collection, Volume 2. Upon joining Pixar, he animated and directed several commercials and has been nominated for eight, I said eight, Academy Awards, including Best Animated Feature Film Winners, Up and Inside Out, and nominees, Monster Inc., and Best Original Screenplay for Up, Inside Out, and Wall-E. In 2010, Up was also nominated for Best Picture Oscar by the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts, and Sciences. So without any further ado, I'd like to first introduce Dr. Paul Cox, who will be conducting the interview here he Thank is, you, ladies and gentlemen. Absolutely. And a round of applause one more time for Pete Doctor, Pixar's chief creative officer. Enjoy. Awesome to see human beings. Awesome to see your faces. And so happy to be here um, with, with Pete Doctor. 
Uh, full disclosure, Pete is my brother-in-law. Uh, I can't often call people in Hollywood or at Pixar and say, hey, let's, let's hang out on Sunday afternoon. So thank you, Pete, for joining <laughs> us. It's great to see you. Happy to be here. Yeah, yeah. Good to see you. Pete is calling in from his treehouse uh, in, in the uh, East Bay, and uh, it's an amazing, amazing place, and uh, a place where you are allowed to be a child at heart, for sure. So thanks for being here, Pete. Um, yeah. Our students just played, and for everybody, uh, these guys are going to be in New York, May 16th, doing two sets at Dizzy's Club as part of a jazz at Lincoln Center and they're appearing with Dom, and we're so excited. And on that trip, we're going to be going to the National Jazz Museum in Harlem, and we're going to see the Soul exhibition there, and um, really excited to see that. Um, the reason we're doing this today is because uh, the pandemic has been long and hard, and when I was watching Soul, I think for the fourth time, I had this thought, we really need to thank uh, educators, the teachers that have worked so hard to educate our families, our students, and for two years. And I thought this would be a wonderful event to honor them. Because for me, Soul is an homage to teachers, and it's a beautiful one. So let's turn to some questions for Pete. Um, April is Jazz Appreciation Month, and Soul is also uh, just a wonderful, great movie about jazz. It has so many subtle things in it that jazz musician can go, oh, Pixar again did their homework. So Pete, I'm wondering how this idea germinates. What's the initial spark that gets you to this story and to this music? Well, it's actually kind of a personal story, uh, believe it or not. And it really stems from my own love of animation and feeling like I was born to do this and spending my whole life doing it and reaching a point in my middle age where I'm like, how many more of these are, is this really the best use of my time? And kind of asking those big existential questions. So without mirroring that too closely, we wanted to find a guy who had a noble profession that we could all root for and, and get behind. We thought musician. And out of all of them, like, you know, we played around with rock musician or classical. Jazz just seemed like something you do, not because you want to get famous, uh, because you love it, you know. Um, and so I'd always loved jazz. I kind of weirdly grew up on 30s and 40s jazz, big band and stuff. Um, and when we hooked up with John Batiste, who did the music, in the film, he said, yeah, I want to do user-friendly jazz, which was great for us because jazz can go so many different ways. Um, but the more we learned about jazz, the more we realized how central it was to the story uh, of the film. You know, this idea that with jazz, you take whatever you are given. You have a melody and it comes to you and you then you turn it into something impersonal and hopefully beautiful and expressive. And that's just what we were trying to say with the movie. So it really was like a hand and a glove uh, fit. Um, and of course, then we got to do lots of cool research, go to clubs in New York. Well, somebody had to do that, you know. I volunteered, so. You grew up in a musical family. Uh, your sisters are musicians. Your parents are music educators. Did that have any influence on your storytelling in this film? Well, yeah, of course. Um, Music was a huge part of my life growing up, and still is, and um, I think has a direct cause effect on where I ended up. I mean, I, I was a kid who loved to perform but hated to practice, and so predictably my uh, skills never rose above a certain level, you know, um, unlike my sisters. Uh, but I do think the appreciation for jazz, the, uh, for, for music rather, the um, timing, uh, is directly connected, you know, as, uh, as we're working on a sequence, I'll, I'll, I will hear it. I can tell when something is two or three, you know, one, two frames off, just because it's, it's all about rhythm and synchronicity. And um, as an animator, same thing, as I would sit down to animate, like on Toy Story or whatever, I would hear it in my head, almost like Carl Stalling, you know, the guy who did all the Warner Brothers music, I would hear, 
dun, 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 dun. and I knew that was the timing that I wanted just based on what was in my head. So all thanks to music. We love John Batiste here. He played on Jazz Fest many years ago. We have a wonderful jazz festival that's been going on for well over 40 years. What was it like to work with him? Were you able to do some extracurricular things like hang out, go to restaurants? Yeah, so the first time I met him was at um, this guy who does all the music coordinating at Disney. And, he, and we show up and nobody's there and we're waiting and it's like 45 minutes late and finally John shows up and I think he had like neon bright pants and a checkered shirt with a jacket and he's like woo and so I I sit down and I pitch him the thing and he goes yeah and I thought he was insane or something you know he just wouldn't stop making these noises of of enthusiasm for the story that I was pitching and I was not sure if it was actually getting in or if he was kind of just toying with me or if what what was going on but um and so i guess my initial thought was like this guy's almost too much but he became one of our best friends on the show and i got to go to new york and uh you know have dinners and so on and he's just about the most giving loving person i've ever met he is one of these people who just lights up the room when you walk in and contrary to my first uh, experience he's very knowledgeable he's super smart he can talk for days about jazz about the history of jazz about the technique uh players not only that he, he <laughs> when we were recording i was talking to him about like earl father hines who's one of my favorite uh pianists and he was like oh yeah and he starts and he can play in the style of almost anybody you 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 want to meet so it's it's like an impersonator, but with music. <laughs> it's really cool. That's awesome. Uh, we have some questions from students, and one of them was uh, related to this. Um, what were rehearsals like and the recording session for this movie? And this is from Nehemiah Baker, the drummer who you just heard. Mm. Yeah, um, it was totally different than anything we've done. So usually, uh, just to set the the tone, like if, if I'm working with Randy Newman or uh, Michael Giacchino, we'll have finished the picture, we will have locked it, which means we're, every frame is where it should be, every frame of movement, and they write the music, and then you hear a click track, if you're one of the musicians, you're, and then you play along to that track, so we know exactly what we're going to get. With John, we had no idea. Uh, we had not finished the picture because we wanted to work backwards. We wanted the musicians in the movie to follow what he was doing. So we set up tons of GoPros everywhere on all the musicians. Um, but we didn't even really know, like we would talk about what tunes we needed, um, but he was a little freeform. So, you know, he would, he had like um, a couple tunes. We had no idea where they were going to go and we just record them. And then we would later put them in the, the live ones. Of course, we knew we wanted, you know, high energy or a low, um, like a mellow kind of piece. Um, for those, like I say, we, we had a pretty good idea of what we were doing, but a lot, a lot of it was just kind of hang on and trust the process. And, uh, sure enough, it, it worked. The, the sections of the film where they're sort of in the netherworld between reality and um, uh, this spacey kind of area um, where he's in kind of a flow state. Um, like uh, w when the hippie guy is in the ship and they're, they're encountering the lost souls. What is the, what is the inspiration behind that? Well, that I think most people could relate to this idea. The idea is that when you're doing something that you really love and you're connected to it, you get into this state of flow. And I, I'm sure most people have had this experience where you're playing or, or drawing or writing and you are just so into it. And then you sort of snap out and you're like, was that 15 minutes or, or five hours? I have no idea. You know, you just go to this other place. And we were trying to represent that um, as this kind of state of consciousness that uh, that happens when you're really in the zone. Um, and then, of course, we were trying to use it for, for story reasons as well. That's great. Um, can you talk about some of, when you did Inside and Out, you worked a lot on uh, demonstrating the various emotions that 
uh, adolescent girl might have. Can you talk about how you worked on expressing emotions in soul, specifically when it comes to how do you animate a soul after they are mm -hmm. in the, uh, the netherworld? Yeah, that was one of the more challenging parts of the film when we talked about what is a soul? You know, of course, we do research, which we do for most of our films on whatever the subject is, cars or robots or whatever. In this case, um, went back to various uh, um, traditions throughout history, throughout the world, and uh, looked for clues. Like, what do people say our souls look like? And, of course, it was like vaporous, non-physical, invisible, not very helpful for actually making the movie. But we tried to um, represent that in some way, in the way that they look. They're sort of foggy and blue. Um, um, I think the film overall was a great excuse to dive into some great uh, philosophy. You know, I'd, I grew up um, in high school, taken in college, taking philosophy classes and, you know, echoing essentialism, sort of Plato and Aristotle thing, and then arguing against that with our character 22 is like a nihilist, you know, she's like, eh, Life is meaningless. There's no purpose. Uh, and then, of course, coming out without being a spoiler here, uh, uh, ex existentialism, you know, this idea that like Sartre or Kierkegaard uh, put forward that uh, you first exist and now you have to find why you're here and everyone has to find that out for themselves. Um, but what a joyful thing that is and how wonderful, what a, an amazing opportunity that we all have to do that. Um, uh, through the expression of what we love, whatever that is. And I think um, for a lot of us who were born with a, a passion or habit, whatever you want to say, um, there is a sense sometimes that that is what you're here for. Um, but I think life is more than that. And um, that's one part of it. It's a really cool part. It's a great gift for, for us and hopefully for the world as well. Um, but it's just one part. That's great. Um... Do you have any like preparatory drawings you could show us um, that give us sort of an inside look on your artistic process? Sure. Let me see if I can figure out how to screen share here. <clears throat> um, here we go. Um, <laughs> okay. Share. See, I should know more about how this works than I do by now, but okay. Here is um, some early drawings of Joe that one of our artists did. And you know, we do thousands and thousands of these trying to discover what is this guy like? This was one direction, here's another one that's, uh, you know, he's this exhausted type. We wanted to show both the good side and the bad side of teaching, you know, that sometimes kids are apathetic and, and clueless and so it, it really tweaks Joe's, you know, pulls the string. Um, and then we did a lot of research looking at real life musicians, our Blakey, as you can see here. Uh, you know, we actually got to uh, visit with Quincy Jones and um, 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 Herbie Hancock, which is amazing. So ultimately, we kind of locked in on this idea of this kind of cool older guy who is a little bit dorky, but um, oops, now I've got the spinning wall wheel of death. Hold on a second. Anyway, he, yeah, so he's. He's cool, but a little bit left in a previous generation, you know. And Kemp Powers, who was one of our, um, uh, he was the writer, so we, one of the writers. We had three, three of us that worked on it. He uh, was a jazz critic, grew up in, uh, in uh, Queens. Um, and um, so a lot of the specificity of who ja uh, Joe was came from, from Kemp, as well as our culture trust. You know, and, and really the reason we made Joe African American was because of jazz. You know, jazz is like the great contribution, one of the many contributions of, of African Americans in America. And um, so this was a, a larger crew, a group that we went out to Queens and studied this guy here as a, a middle school teacher. There's Herbie Hancock. So it was pretty awesome. We had a good time. Um, and all of that went into who Joe was and what he's all about. Um, I'm, it's, spin, it's spinning again, sorry. I don't know what's going on. Well, anyway, here, let's see if it ever comes out of that. Do you have any other questions while we're waiting for the no, computer? No, I, I, I just wanted to give a shout out to probably one of the great educators is uh, right out in the East Bay who's retiring this year, uh, um, uh, teacher um, Bob Athade. He's a wonderful, uh, mm -hmm. Dominic went to school with his son who 
uh, he's uh, an inspiration, much like Joe, um, and has built a program out there uh, for years. Um, so you do a lot of research, you go to clubs, you go out to eat, um, I'm gonna, and, <laughs> yes. uh, and, then, yeah, so, and then, and then, you, and then you start making the movie, so. Yeah, and these are some of the early, oh, here's a, our, our list of um, folks that we, we got to work with, some pretty amazing folks. Um, you can see um, Dr. Peter Archer was the guy that I, I pointed at, who's, uh, he just retired, a uh, teacher in Queens. So then we started modeling it in the computer, and some of the drawings, you know, look very different when, when you get them 3D. And we wanted to uh, have a sense of caricature, caricature by exaggerating shapes, which we always do. But we also needed to be very sensitive to things that could be offensive. So there was a lot of back and forth with people um, before we sort of arrived at Joe as, as he uh, shows up in the movie. Stuff. So can you hear me? Yeah. So this next question is, um, is important, and it comes from um, Eli Letter, one of our students. And he asked, how did the creative process change during COVID? Yeah, it was tricky. And I really think the only reason we were able to continue working on the movie was because we had built up a, a collaboration and trust that we had had before. Um, we, let's see, it was like on a Wednesday, everybody got sent home. And um, I thought, well, there goes the movie. Um, but thankfully, a lot of the, um, our technical group had, had come up with ways, like three years before, of basically, um, you would take home this little box and a monitor, and it would wire into the computer at work. And so instead of taking a big, massive, uh, powerful computer home with you, you were, it was a thing called a Teradici, and it was basically a remote control. The big, heavy, massive computer stayed at work, and everybody um, had these remote control units at their house, and we continued on working. By the next week, we were up and running, doing just as much uh, work as we were while we were all together. Um, and that was on Seoul. On the next one that came out, Luca, that was done even more at home, and uh, finding or turning red, which just came out on Disney Plus, that was done almost entirely at home. So I feel bad for for everyone on those shows because it's not as much fun when you're not together. But you know, you do what you have to do. And we're hoping now um, COVID's starting to get better. We're we're starting to get back to work. Um, I feel like the things we learn from it are, you know, there are some things you can do at home wherever at a coffee shop but there are a lot of like whenever you get together creatively collaboratively you want to be in person because you know the the little clues you get in zoom are it's better than nothing but it's still only a small per percentage of what you actually connect with people when you're in person that's true all those little expressions the raised eyebrow or the scowl all the things that you kind of lose with a mask um, that that's that's that tells a lot to a filmmaker. How did that scene work? Uh, no, no. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, one more question from a student. This is from Ava Preston, uh, one of our our singers. Um, she asks, "How can you be effective leader of a project in a creative session uh, setting? Creative setting. How can you be a an effective leader?" of a project in a creative setting. Uh, and I guess adding on to what we just talking about, in a creative setting when you're not together, I guess that would be my add on to that question. Yeah, well, I think the thing that I've, I'm still learning how to do as a director, you know, I think the, the tendency when you're first starting out, probably I would guess in almost any creative endeavor is that you think it's up to you to solve all the problems. I got to come up with the design. I got to, you know, write the story myself. I got to do all this stuff. And you realize, you know what? Everybody wants to be contributing to this. And most people that I work with are way more talented than I am in whatever they do, whether that be lighting or animation or design. So the best thing I could do as a creative leader is to find ways to unlock and invite them forward to bring what they're going to bring. Now, you don't want to do that just like, 
sit back and open the doors because they're going to pour their hearts out, but in directions that don't work with what you're trying to do. So what I've tried to learn, and I'm still learning, are use you know what are ways in which you can communicate to people that allow them to understand what's needed emotionally without dictating what it is I want. So instead of saying, I want this to be red and spiky uh, and uh, sharp, I might say something like, this should feel very aggressive. It should make me feel like if I touch it, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get pricked. And that might be that the artist would come back with something red and spiky, but it might be something that they do, something I had never thought of, something much better than that. So um, I feel like that's really the key is um, learn to communicate in emotional ways about what it is you're after, because ultimately anything, movies, music, I gotta believe is the same. It's like, how do we express emotions and bring that to other people? It's like these magic communicators, right? That you put out there and when the audience hears it or watches it, the emotion hits them. You know, so that's ultimately what we're always after is that sense of uh, expression and emotion. And how do I trigger that in, in the audience? And I think it, it works the same way uh, creatively, collaboratively. Uh, that, does that make sense? It does. What, uh, tell us honestly, uh, when you realized you couldn't s release this film in theaters, we are so lucky today to be able to watch this film in a, in a beautiful theater with a brand new sound system. And when we tested yeah, you guys it... Are one, of the, one of the few. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think even our crew has seen it. Most of the crew has not seen it in a theater. Send them here. So. We'll, we'll do a special yeah, show. Okay. <laughs> um, but the sound uh, of John's playing and, and, the, and the group and, and um, Trent Reznor's soundtrack is so dramatic that when we tested it, uh, I wouldn't let him turn it off. I sat, right, Tommy, <laughs> is Tommy here? We just watched, uh, you know, for, for about an hour. And I said, turn it up a little bit more. How about a little bit more? And it was so immersive. Uh, and I really wish more people could have that experience uh, of seeing this film. Um, how did you feel when you realized it was only gonna be I mean, streaming is great. You reach a massive audience, but how did you feel? Yeah, I mean, without, this is gonna sound a little dramatic, but it was a little like a death, you know? It felt really like, oh man, we spent, I mean, from the beginning, we spent four and a half years on this film, which is fast, actually, for most Pixar films. Most are around five or even six years. Um, so it was kind of like, oh, now we're just gonna, throw, I mean, I had no real idea at that time what streaming was about. I mean, obviously I knew, but in terms of the relationship with the audience, um, when you sit in a theater, as you know, as a, as a performer, you can hear, you can feel whether you're connecting with the audience or not. With this, it's a little more like a black box. You put it out there and kind of trust that people will A, watch it, <laughs> and B, uh, react to it in some way. Had no idea, so it's still a little bit like well, I've heard from a few folks who saw the film and were affected by it, but a lot of it is kind of a mystery. I don't really know how much it, uh, people attach to it or not, um, which was a bummer. Um, so, you know, but what are you going to do? Like I say, uh, it's, we were very lucky to be able to have it seen at all, and that was thanks to, thanks to uh, Disney Plus and Bob Iger. They, you know, they had, had come up with this idea, and it was all, I mean, boy, can you imagine if they hadn't, COVID would have hit and Disney had, you know, between theme parks, cruise ships, uh, movies, it's all in-person communal stuff. And without Disney Plus, I don't know, they probably would have, they would have suffered a lot more than they did. Yeah, Disney Plus got my family through the pandemic for sure. Um, how about you guys? <laughs> you got, yes, there's a lot of nods and applause here for Disney Plus. Um, uh, I lost my train of thought, but it's okay. Um, I do have, we, I do have, uh, oh um, yes, some... I, I wanted to tell the audience that when we set this up, uh, Pete uh, really wanted to come have popcorn with you after the film so he could get your feedback. Um, I smell popcorn now, so if you wanna get up and uh, go out and, and get some food, 
Um, feel free. We'll start the movie in about 15, 20 minutes. Um, and so, for sure, we can bring, we're allowed to bring popcorn into the theater, which is a miracle, frankly. So, does anybody have any questions for, for Pete? Yes. Okay. He is here. I will repeat the question. Did you get any of that? Not, not a word. Couldn't hear anything. Yeah, I'll paraphrase. She was saying okay. that uh, this is going to be her fourth time seeing it. She's here with her mom. Her name is Kate. Um, the themes you explored in the film were so deeply profound uh, and kind of unlike anything she'd seen in film. Um, and I'm not going to turn a question into it, but can I? May I turn a question into that? I think well, a lot of, of thank you. That's really cool I think a lot of people, for me, especially, I, it took me three times to kind of like get the spiritual, existential side of it, um, and I'm with Kate on this. I don't know of another model, maybe Igmar Bergman, um, or other European directors, um, Herzog maybe. Um, so maybe, uh, did you have any, um, Kurosawa maybe, any of um, filmmakers you were inspired by that made their way into Seoul? Yeah, I mean, all the guys that you mentioned um, are amazing and, um, um, but really I think the spirit of this was um, me feeling like, okay, if I look back at all of the Pixar films, they all come down to relationship, right? It's a struggle, this character wants this or that, and then in the end, the answer is they need to connect and relate and have a connection with these other characters. And I thought, could I do a movie where that is not the answer? And I think I proved the answer is no, uh, because you still have Joe uh, relating, and that is the sort of feel good of it, is the connection with 22. But I think, uh, in a way, um, I was able to stretch out of that. It's really a connection to the world, you know. Um, anything that you do has a positive and a negative, and a, or a, a potential positive and negative, you know. So this, this beautiful gift of music could be a thing that walls you off, that pulls you into yourself and uh, becomes a private, um, lonely, potentially, even thing. Um, and so the connection with the world was really something I was trying to talk about in the movie. Um, and I think Joe feels this, this pull of music beyond just his selfish goal of um, making it as a musician. Um, as, and instead, really into something more that, like John Batiste talked about, this music is a gift to the world. And so every time we do it, it's a, it's a, it's it's work, right? It takes something out of you. Um, it uh, you you when you play, it you can feel at least I can like you feel sort of not depleted. You feel a withdrawal. Um, but that's for the better. It's almost like an investment if you get into the money of it. Like you're you're putting it out there in hopes that it'll bounce around, reverberate, and exaggerate, and and get even louder um, thanks to the people that are responding to it. So uh, that didn't really answer your question at all. But that's that's um, what I was trying to get to. Yeah, it reminds me in the a move, moment in the movie when he finally gets to play his gig at the half note, and. He has a great time, 
there swinging, and it's a dream come true. He spent his whole life trying to get to this moment. And then he goes and he stands out on the street, and he goes, is, is that it? And that's kind of like, I hate to say this, but kind of the tragedy of music is it's a temporal art form. It be has a beginning and an ending, and then, uh, then what do you do? Uh, and, mm -hmm. and so to be a musician and to practice and to really dedicate hundreds, thousands, ten, tens of thousands of, of hours um, and then to have that moment, what carries you through uh, to the next? There's no, there's no question in this. I'm just, I'm riffing. I'm riffing. <laughs> uh, but I, I want to riff right into um, a shout out to your mom because she's watching on Facebook. Hi, Rita. Uh -huh. Thank you for making Pete and Kari <laughs> and Kirsten. I love them. Um, and so, yeah, rift right into a corner there. Awesome. My mom, my mom <laughs> both parents uh, are, are teachers and um, um, were a huge part of the film, whether they knew it or not. Um, you know, we tried to show if you watch at the beginning, Joe is kind of being tortured by teaching. And uh, we, we did, we kind of ripped ourselves into a corner of saying, we, are we making a judgment that teaching sucks? You know, uh, so we, try, we tried to balance that and, and really represent what teachers do bring uh, out into the world. You know, it might be more important than any performer, really, because teachers have this deep ability to, to touch students in what profound ways that last them through their whole life so hats off to teachers yeah let's uh i was thinking uh, uh when you were talking about teachers that kurt vonnegut when he was alive used to uh query the audience he used to say um ask everybody about their heroes and then he said raise your hand if your hero is a teacher and I was in Severance Hall when he did this, and everybody raised their hand. And uh, I think cool. teachers are an unsung, the unsung heroes of our of our of our civilization, really. So thank you for honoring yes. teachers. I really, 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 that's incredibly moving. Can we give them some applause for that? Nice. Um, we're going to get some popcorn and, and clear the stage so we can watch your film. Um, we are not allowed to stream it, so we're going to have to say goodbye to you. So. Okay. Thank you for watching. Thanks for talking with me. All right. Thank you, Pete, Thank Doctor. You and uh, we'll see you in a month. Bye-bye. So popcorn out in the, in the lobby. You've got 15 minutes, and we will wait for you and then start the film when you get in. Thank you for being here.